Hello there and welcome to the series of videos that's going through the content of A-level maths. Here we're transforming trigonometric graphs so we can answer questions from exercise 9G. So the same transformations are going to be applying to the sine and the cos graph but we're just going to go over what they would look like for these special graphs here. Okay, so the first type of graph transformation we're going to look at is a stretching vertically by a factor of a. So if we times the front of a sine graph by a value, let's say a, or if it was maybe 2, we'd be stretching up by a factor of 2 and down by a factor of 2 as well, because we need to consider, remember, that the y-axis here is effectively our, sorry, the x-axis here is effectively our centre of stretching. If the graph was y equals minus sine x, then we would be reflecting in the x-axis because any positive y-coordinates would now be negative and any negative coordinates would now be positive. Okay, so this is what it's going to look like here, the reflection of minus, the reflection of sine, which is minus sine theta. Okay, and another type of reflection here would be sine of negative theta, now what that's going to do, it's not going to reflect in this axis here, it's going to reflect in the other axis, the y-axis. All the theta angles are going to now be negated. So if we apply that transformation onto the graph here, it would give us this graph here, because remember sine is going to continue on this way, so it's this part of the graph here that's going to be transformed onto the right, so it's going to start going downwards first. So minus sine theta here, is equal to sine of minus theta here because the graphs are equal. Same thing works for cos. If we want to stretch it vertically upwards and downwards by a factor, we times it by a at the front. Minus cos theta will reflect it in the um, x-axis like this. And cos of minus theta will reflect it in the y-axis uh, and it will look like this. It looks exactly the same as it did before and that's because if we were to continue on this graph here, we would see exactly the same thing on the left and right. Effectively, it's symmetric about the y-axis. Okay, a second type of graph transformation here, and that is translation up and down. So if we add on a after we have signed our theta, then we're going to move it vertically upwards or downwards, depending on the value of a. So for example, sine theta plus 1 will shift our graph up by 1. So be really careful of your graph intersections here. Uh, it's only going to intersect at 270 here, and the rest of it's going to be above the axis here. Uh, y equals minus 2 sine theta. This is going to be a translation down by 2. So considering your axis intersections here, if we're moving down by 2 from this original graph, we're going to be down at minus 1, our highest point. So we never actually are going to intersect the x-axis. Okay, graph transformation type number three is where we add an angle onto our theta angle. And remember, when it's inside the brackets, it's effectively opposite land. So where you would think we'd move it right, we'd actually move it left by that value of A. And if A was a negative number, we would move it right, the opposite of what you would think. So for example, if we were to do sine theta plus 90, you would think we would move it more positive to the right here. But in fact, the theta degrees now need to be 90 less than they were to get the same sine angle. So we'd in fact move it left by 90 degrees here. So this would be left by 90 degrees. So all of the coordinates here would be moved left by 90. Make sure you uh, pay full attention to your graph intersections and where your peaks and your troughs are on your graph. Don't just move it left by something. Make sure that it does fully match up. If you have a trough at 270, that trough now needs to be at 180, for example. And in this graph here, sine of, thir sine of theta minus 30. Now this is going to be moving it right by 30 degrees. So try your best to see how that would look. It's now going to intersect at 30 degrees. It's now going to come down and intersect at 210 degrees, etc., etc. So work with those intersection points and work with those peaks and troughs when you're transforming a graph. Okay, another type of graph transformation is when we're multiplying our theta angle by something. So therefore, theta needs to be um, 1 over a as a multiple less than it did before. 
So we're going to squish it in uh, in the x-axis direction horizontally by a factor of 1 over a. So if we get something like y equals sine of 2 theta here, you would expect to stretch it out by a factor of 2, but that's wrong. You would actually squish it in by a factor of a half, um, so half all of the theta angles here. And we're going to have to continue on our graph and squish that in so we get up to 360 here. So where we had an intersection of 180 before, now we intersect at 90. Where we had a trough at 270 before, now we have a trough at 135, etc, etc. Work with your peaks, work with your troughs and work with your intersections. What happens when we get sine of theta over 3, however? Um, instead here, the theta angle needs to be 3 times as big to get the same sine result. So in this case here, we're going to stretch it outwards by a factor of 3. And you can see here we've changed the, um, the x coordinates to account for that stretching. We've tripled all of the x coordinates that we've got here, here, and so on. So remember, inside the brackets is opposite land. You would do the opposite transformation to how you would expect. Oppos inside the brackets as well is movement horizontally as well. Anything outside the brackets acts as normal, and that's a vertical movement. Right, okay, a little question that they could ask you then. The graph shows the function sine theta plus k, um, and we have an intersection up here at 91.5. Write down the value of k. Well, what we could do here is compare it to the normal sine graph that would start at 0, um, where this starts here, and it, you would usually intersect at 90 at 1, but instead here it's 1.5, so we can see here we've just shifted it upwards, by 0.5. What is the smallest positive value of theta that gives a minimum point? So the smallest uh, possible value of theta that gives a minimum point here would be the 270 marker here, and that point would be at minus 0.5. Okay, let's have a go at this question here now. So it's cos theta plus k. So we've obviously moved it left by some amount because the transformation is inside the brackets. I assume here k is positive. Write down the value of k. Well, here we've got an intersection at 70, so this is going to be our clue here. Usually it would intersect at 90 degrees. So, therefore, k must equal 20 degrees because we've moved left by 20 degrees on the x-axis. Part B to this question is find the value of theta at x. Well, it would usually come back up at 270 degrees. So moving it left by 20 would give us 250. And the third question for this part here is what is the minimum coordinate here? Well, this minimum coordinate here would have been at 180. So it's now going to be at 160. And the value of this minimum point is minus 1. So 160 minus 1 is your answer there. What is the value of cos theta at y? Well, in this case here, what we're going to have to work out is um, substituting theta into our angle here. So this is going to be cos of 0 plus 20. So the answer to the y coordinate here is just going to be the value of cos 20. So we know that theta is 0, so we get 0 0.94 there. Right, okay then, so pause the video and have a go at these questions. Right, well done for having a go at these questions here. So the first thing I would think I'll show you with this question here is how we would draw the cos graph in between minus 360 to 360, and it would look something like this. So therefore, negative cos x in between three, minus 360 to 360, is it going to be reflected in the x-axis. So it's going to start up here and go downwards like that, and start up here and go downwards like that. And let's put on some intersections as well, just so we're super clear as to what our diagram is supposed to look like. We don't want any ambiguity in what the examiner thinks we've put. Okay, so there we are. That's all we need to put there. It doesn't need to be the most beautiful graph. It does say just sketch. And this really is helping you build up some skills 
for what we're going to use in solving uh, trigonometric equations. Question 3c here is sketch sine of a third x, so that means not squishing it in by a factor of a third, but squishing it outwards by a factor of a third. So the normal sine graph in between minus 360 to 360 will look like this. It will intersect at, so 180, a point, a, tr a, a height of 90, a trough of 270, and at 360. So now we've got to stretch this outwards by a factor of 3, because inside the brackets is opposite land. So the 90 uh, peak here is going to be now at 270, and it's just going to stretch its way upwards to there, and then it's going to start to come back downwards. Um, and it's uh, 180 times 3 is 540, so by the time it's got to the 360 marker here, it's not going to have um, come back down to the intersection point here. And the same for the negative side here. This is going to be at minus 270, so it's going to come downwards here, and it's going to start to come back upwards before minus 360, but it's not going to intersect the axes here. So this is your final answer to question 3C. Right then, so have a plenty of practice at these types of questions here, so you can answer questions from exercise 9G. Uh, persevere through the difficult ones and ask your teacher for help if you need any. Thanks very much for watching.